Hello everybody and welcome to a pretty special episode here. It's something I'm trying that's going to be brand new. I've gotten so many questions over and over and over again. How I prime stuff. And I've done blog posts on it. Still images, that sort of thing. Step by steps. But I thought if I do something like this for the YouTube channel. Then it's more of a video reference. And I think even more people can have access to it. Now you see a whole collection of stuff out here. You see units, like our Kingsguard over there and our conscripts. We have some uh, Shadespire style figures. We've got big child creative figures. We have a big old monster there. We have some Blackheart busts. Sitting in the middle of all that is Dino Riz. And that's, that's kind of the main story of what we're going to cover here. We're not really going to talk about needle sizes. We're not going to talk about PSI, anything like that. We just, we're going to use a badger airbrush with a badger compressor. And we're going to use Dino Res primer right here. Now there's 12 different colors. So you can really do a lot. You can mix these if you want to create even more colors. And you're going to see, what I'm going to try and do is use as many of these as possible. Just to give you a sense of what you can do. There's the obvious black, white, and gray. But you've got these other ones. You know, you've got the yellows here. I'm going to let that thing focus on that. You've got some browns, like this reddish brown right over here. So why not make use of all those? Now I'm going to set this down here so I can actually show you what a few primed things look like. This is one of the first things we'll tackle. And this is a unit. Again, this is Song of Ice and Fire. You can see we've got some shading going on there's a little bit of light to dark i can even take some of these off of here and again you can see that the base is a little bit darker than the upper side of the figure because i did about four colors down there i did some some of the green some of the tan some of the reddish brown got some other stuff here how about some busts how about some dinosaurs everybody loves dinosaurs you can see on this one here, especially on this end, see how there's a little bit of red there that's showing through? That's not the resin, because the resin is the same yellow on those other dinosaurs that you see. So this is another one where I just let the primer do the talking. We've even got Creature Caster figure here, and this has a real different tint to it. You can see we got some bluish primer on there. That was a whole different set of colors that we used on that. Because um, this is going to ultimately, in the end, it's going to be more of a zinchy blue type of thing. And last but not least, I'll show you this too. So I don't have any vehicles prepped here. They're all kind of being used up already. So what I'm going to do is do a special video on how I prime videos and use their prime vehicles and use the airbrush on those. I did want to show you this. So this is a turret here. This is at Little Wars. I was working on this started out just like this here and with a few washes and a few other little nifty tricks we timed it in 57 seconds I think it was 47 seconds we went from this to this so that's one of the reasons why I do this pre-shading that you see me doing here so again we've got all kinds of fun stuff and more big child creatives bust right here and like I said the first thing we're gonna tackle is priming units and maybe what we'll do is is a few different colors of those so we'll just we'll start out with these smaller figures right here this is going to be a different set of colors than this one this one might be more of a bluish gray right here this one right here is going to be more of a tan and airbrush wise this is just a Sutar 2020 right here like I said I got a badger compressor it's one of the larger ones it also has the obligatory water trap on it. You kind of want that. But I'm also going to pick this up here and show you the, the spray booth that I got. Now you're going to hear my voice change a little bit because I'm going to be wearing a mask. And this booth is going to be running. Now let's see if I can reach this over here. So this is, we've got a, another filter for it right here. I always try to have more than one of those on hand. Now this whole spray booth here, and it'll kind of go out a little bit. 
it's about 89-ish, 90 dollars, somewhere thereabouts on Amazon. So it's not an expensive thing, and it really does the job. I couldn't believe it when I used it, and then when I stopped, when my old one finally died after many, many hours of use, and I saw all the dust, which was basically paint that would have been in the house all over the place in my lungs. That was why I got me another one of these guys. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna fire up that we're gonna fire up the booth and we're gonna get some primer in here and we're just gonna like I said we're gonna start with some of these units and then we'll work our way into the bigger stuff. So we'll be right back with that. So I've got my conscripts placed out here on a board. You see how it sort of extends my, my little turntable right there. You do have to measure that piece of cardboard though because it can get a little bit too long and it's going to extend out over the edges and bash into your sides of your spray booth. So we're starting out with that reddish brown primer. I don't remember what it's called. It's the one that I can never remember the name to. And all this is, we're trying to get most of the figure covered with this. And I'm not going to be too crazy if it doesn't hit 100% in one area or another because we're putting other colors over the top of this. And that's the whole point of this, is to try and spray it in multiple layers. Starting out with this reddish brown, well obviously these are the conscripts, so they're not Night's Watch, they're not going to have black. They're going to be more in reds, browns, tans, that are a little bit darker. So if I can get a little bit of that reddish brown to start off with, hey, so is the better. And you can see I'm holding them maybe about four inches away at this point. I will do some general overspray as we move through this here. But right now, I'm just trying to get to each guy. You could, if you had less of these, let's see, I only had five or six to prime. You could have them on a little, some little miniature holder. And then you'd be able to get to the whole thing a little bit easier. You wouldn't have to do what I'm doing, where you have to hold it up by its head or by its sword. These are one-piece plastic miniatures, so it's really not a big deal. Not like I'm going to hurt him or anything like that. Now, this is actually one of those alternate conscript sculpts. I think I put about three or four in this unit. It's from the Game Night package, actually. I did that so that A, this unit has a little more spice to it, a little bit of difference, and now I could actually make a second unit of conscripts out of this. So it's, you give the Night's Watch a little taste of free folk. And I was going to keep on going here with my, with my reddish brown, again, I, I could try and find the name, but there is only one reddish brown primer. Of the 12 colors, there's only one that looks like this. So you'll be able to figure it out. I trust you. Now, one thing it is important is to try and turn that thing upside down and get a little bit of a spray on the underside there. <clears throat> when they have cloaks like that, it's going to be a little more tricky to get to that underside. In the past, I used to never have the figures on a base. Just because it was easier to get at the undersides now between the airbrush and now that I do the oil painting and even that much more of a glazing technique it's not that big of a deal. It's just it's easy for me to get paint down on those undersides there, especially with the oils. Now this is actually a Free Folk Spearwife, speaking of alternate sculpts. This is one that I'm going to be painting pretty soon here, and then I'm going to do some special painting tutorials just on this, because I have a few other ones. They're part of a Spearwife unit already. And you can see, what once I'm done here, well, then I'll be free to spray over the top and get the rest of these could be a little bit reddish brown and I think one thing you see is especially as I pick up this guy right here he had a lot of primer on him already what was I doing I was actually trying to use the overspray to my advantage so now we'll just spray the rest of the unit and you can see now we're having that extended turntable basically is helpful I suppose what I could do is do a larger circular piece so then I'd have even more... Oh, well, there we go. Actually, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to do me a couple of those. Some larger circular pieces. And basically extend out my turntable. Now, the one downside of that 
and, and you can see there's a couple times where my hand gets out in front of the camera here that's where I'm trying to get to those back figures yeah like that so the, the bigger you make your turntable the farther back you're gonna have to reach now you can already see we haven't been spraying very much here and you can see that the back of that tray or the, behind the tray there you can see how brown that filter is so we're taking this is the ebony hey it's camellia has the name written on it it's basically sort of a dark brown and it's handy for things like these movement trays here and I'm not gonna focus too much on in the crevices so you're gonna see some yellow probably here as I do this it's not a big deal because how am I gonna be painting these things I'm gonna be doing glazes and washes anyway so there's gonna be dark paint getting down into those crevices and that stuff that I used the flex pit not the flex paste the oxide paste gosh there's so many different kinds it absorbs the paint pretty well it doesn't necessarily have to be primed it's just it's good to get a little layer of primer of it heck even the Sculpey accepts paint real well but we got plastic interspersed in this so why not just hit the whole thing with the ebony and that's not a bad idea after doing this maybe I'll even splash some on the figures too especially down on the bases so you see me I don't think I'll be able to pick them up here but I'm just gonna try and spray the down the right around the edge of the bases here it's not important it's not vital at all because they're all gonna be painted with gray liner eventually with a brush but you know it, it's, it also helps to spread that color out a little bit makes it a little more unified it what's interesting though is you know, our next layer we're gonna do green after this so you're gonna see a whole lot less of this red potentially let's say I was gonna use oils here I could just stop at this point and even with acrylics I could stop right here I'm gonna go back over it with my reddish brown just to get it back that the top parts of the figure a little more red this is not the green is not just for some of the cloaks and the clothes it's also for the face too because this way you're already starting to get a little bit of that five o'clock shadow that's the whole idea of this primer painting thing you got 12 colors you can do stuff with why not take advantage of that and quite literally paint with it and what I'll do is and just get my say like like I said just putting the red reddish brown over the top of that then getting ready for the green and it's it's an olive green camo green and I'm not even sure if there's what the official name of it is there's only one green and it's that olive green works great for vehicles of all types sometimes if I'm doing this as a regular priming session I don't have to hit it with a hair dryer because you'll see the other stuff that I'm priming here well I'm just gonna keep going so I the process I just did on this unit I'd have three four five more units sitting out here ready to go so that I wouldn't have to they would dry by themselves here I gotta force the issue a little bit with the hair dryer I try not to put I don't put on blazing hot for one thing especially if it's resin miniatures really don't want to be doing that but it does enough to just kind of cool them down so that we can get in with our green here and I don't clean out the cup in between layers a couple of reasons for that it actually does help the, the red and the green mix together a little bit so sometimes my initial spray is a little bit of a reddish green mix so it's kind of an interesting brown that it makes and at this point I'm just gonna dust over the top now again if my hand gets in the way sorry the camera is at a weird angle here this is not the final setup this was just a test I just want to see if I could actually do it because actually I accidentally had to do a voiceover on a previous video found out that it actually didn't work too badly and I said hmm maybe I can start doing airbrush videos again which might make you guys pretty happy so it's just it's a dusting over the top I know people bandy about that zenithal lighting term I suppose that's what this is 
it's not exactly that because I'm not just taking the airbrush and hold it right over the top. Now the, the SOTAR, it doesn't hold a whole bunch of primer, so you have to keep going back in. But that's okay because I like to do this thing where I mix. I don't necessarily want a ton of primer in that cup. So the SOTAR works out fine, and I use it for hours at a time. I know there are people that say, oh my gosh, what are you doing? You should never use a SOTAR for that. Well, I've been using the same SOTAR. Oh my gosh, I've primed hundreds of figures of all sizes, of all types. I've, I've primed terrain with it. I've even painted backdrops with it. So it, it can handle it. That Badger designs their things to be pretty darn rugged. They don't design them to be fragile. So once we got that all sprayed up with green, we think it's dry. There's this really neat light tan colored primer. It's like a sandy colored. You can imagine it's really great for priming desert vehicles of all types, modern, World War II, whatever. But what it's going to do here on top of that green, it's going gonna, it's gonna to shift it away from the green a little bit. It's also going to lighten these guys. And it's an interesting, like I said, it's, we eventually, I usually throw white as a final layer, a little dusting of white over the top. But this, this is the color that really gets me my my nice light mid-tones here. And when you see me working on these in my painting tutorials, that's where you really see this in action because I can take this and whether it's oils or acrylics, I can do glazes over the top of this. And that's really important. And this is, it's a fantastic, it's a great substitute for the, the old neutral gray. It actually still has that same neutral gray primer that we used for years. You say, why, why are you doing this layers of primer like this? Well, these guys get handled low a lot. Granted, they're magnetized to this movement tray, but they get removed and put back all the time. You can see there's 12 sets on that movement tray. They're being replaced all the time. Taken away, replaced, whatever. And now that you can see the angle that I'm holding that at, that is so that I can just get see like just like right here I'm trying to shoot it from the side and catch some of the edges of that of my little pieces of basing material there and that's that lion themed basing so again here's my final layer it's gonna be white it's a light dusting well we're not trying to kill all the other stuff we spent all this time doing well, otherwise what's the point this one here we want to let that red show a little touch of the green because when we get to the next unit, I'm going to try a little different set of colors on that. And from a distance, they may not look all that different. Look at the difference this makes right here. You can even see the ones that don't have the white versus the ones that are getting it. And you can see how it's just being dusted gently over the top. Now with the white, you want to be careful because it can sometimes have a tendency to spit a little bit. It's just the nature of white. The other primer colors don't necessarily do that. It's just, it's something that white sometimes has a tendency to do. We're just going to go over, and I, I can make these lighter if I want. I want to make these too light. I'm going to do the same thing with the tray, hitting at that real steep angle here, or shallow angle, I guess. Yeah, it's a shallow angle. Sorry about that. And it just picks up those little bits and pieces little bits and pieces right there some of the tree whatever now the badger airbrush cleaner is a fantastic thing I love it sometimes I just have to substitute rubbing alcohol when I'm just using too much stuff normally I don't have to run this stuff through the airbrush because like I said it's a continuous priming not stopping just going 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 but here I had to break these things down into individual segments. So that means shooting this stuff through. I sometimes even unhook the airbrush because I've got a quick release mechanism on there. I'll just take it over the sink and just kind of blast out the cup. Now look at, this is one unit of 12 guys. That, that filter's not blue anymore. Think of your house, your room, whatever. Like the, and, it, and it makes a difference. 
because when we first started using the airbrush here all of a sudden started to see airbrush dust now I had fans going so it wasn't like the it was just sitting there but all of a sudden everything in the room had this layer of dust over it and that was airbrush dust this is a brand new one you can see the walls are very pristine the old one when I took it apart there was a quarter inch of caked dust on it so you can see there's you can still see some of the red on there some of the reddish brown some of the green here's one of our here's our conscript leader right here so they are all set now for painting now the next unit that we're gonna do that's gonna be the King's Guard it's also from Song of Ice and Fire but we want to do something different that we have just matched now that's a unit of oh, those are trappers from the Free Folk again Song of Ice and Fire so we've got another movement tray to prime we got another 12 figures to prime and we'll be right back with that in just a few minutes there we go with our King's Guard We're going to start off our King's Guard this time with the Ebony Primer. Like I said, there's going to be a little bit of a different theme here. I also tossed on some of these, I think they're Shade Spire figures of, of some type. And I knew that at least the bases of these, I knew I wanted to get some of this, the Ebony. And you can see it's a little bit different. Now, maybe hard to tell because these figures are so bright red. But it is, it's a much more muted brown. So it's virtually the same color as the cardboard. And now here I've got those those sculpey chunks there. Those have even more, what do you say, nooks and crannies in there. And now everybody's got capes. I mean, there's just capes all over the place here. So the, these I'm going to really have a little bit of a tougher time getting the primer down in the crevices if need be. And this is what I love about the Steino Res is that it brushes on just as well if not better than when you shoot it through an airbrush because we it's at least three years potentially four or five years we just brushed this stuff on we just took our big old craft brushes brushed it on because we didn't have an airbrush didn't have a spray booth and and again I think in almost every segment I'm gonna say is a spray booth not a bad idea like I said in the opening segment it's somewhere between 80 to 90 dollars and that's that's the whole shebang that's the f an extra filter it's the unit itself it's the hose and another thing too I'll tell you you don't have to vent that hose to the outside now of course I, I have the luxury of this being down in the basement and the hose is really long so I just have it vented 12 14 feet away from me and there's usually some fans going and that helps to keep that stuff just away from me in general now those little banner things in the back those again they're gonna need a little a dose of primer too you'll see that I'm not gonna use as much of the ebony here I, I'm just gonna let let you see the primer color that that pops out into my hand here after I get these last few things with the ebony because you, you'll see here that I'm just not covering the entire figure with this like we did with the conscripts. Sometimes I'll even just do a tiny bit of, on each level, if you want to call it that, you know, working my way up the figure. We're, we're doing, that's the advantage of doing these multiple layers, is that not everyone has to be perfect. If you're doing, the whole thing was ebony primer, yeah, that's a different story. Now I'd have to go over it and make sure I actually had things covered. But we're going to do some interesting stuff here. I have several ways of priming units and figures. It depends on what I've got planned for them in terms of painting. Another reason why I love the, the, these colored primers because they let me customize my priming to what it is that I want to do. Now when I do my vehicles, if I'm doing a, a Russian vehicle, maybe I'll prime it with I'll try and mix up a more of a bluish green, but knowing that I'm probably going to do glazes anyway, not a big deal. Here, these are going to be ethereal, so I'm trying to 
make the muddy stuff be my undertone and then maybe do the ethereal stuff over the top. Sometimes I go the other way around. I could, in theory, spray these with some kind of fluorescent color, a bright thing, or start out with white and then go darker over the top. It all depends what you want to do. It's None of this is rules here. I just I get asked all the time, how the heck do you get all those figures primed? And I, I got blog posts on it. So you can always go to my blog, just papeliasblogspot.com. You can always check that out. But here, I thought this video could be interesting for people. You might be able to see a little bit more than just what the photos do. You kind of see it in action. It's really hard for me to say on a blog post to show you how I'm holding the tray. Now here, I'm just putting my initial layer on so I don't have it at that real shallow angle where I'm shooting the brush sort of right along the side of it. Not going to need to do quite as much with the hair dryer right here. And thank goodness you can't hear that right now. Because between that spray booth and the hair dryer, it was noisy. Uh, that, was, that was real noisy. The compressor's quiet. Because I'm using one of the Badger, I think it's a, they call it a tankless compressor. It's the big unit. I also have the more portable one. I use them both. You can imagine that when I have, whenever I have to do something away from my main station, or not at the house, I'm going to use the small one. And it works fine. wouldn't necessarily suggest using that every day for nine hours. The other one, it's designed for this kind of use. Or you're doing mass amounts of figures here. So like I said, you're not going to see me doing quite the overspray with the ebony like I did with the reddish brown. Because this, this next color, and it has nothing to do with the color of the plastic of the Shadespire figures, but this slate blue, it's one of my favorite primer colors. I don't get to use it that often. I think if I did more sci-fi stuff, maybe I get to use it more. But it's just, it's a neat, look at this. So it just gives us a whole different look, besides my hand, than the reddish brown did. It's going to cover exactly the same. It's the same primer. It's just a different color. And my whole plan here is to do this undertone of this bluish slate color and then go over the top with the whites and the golds instead of, well, maybe I have to paint in those cooler colors. So just by default, my lighter colors are going to have a little more of an interesting look to them then if I just, let's say I just prime them white. Okay, I could do that. And I could do a bunch of dark glazes, especially now with GW and their, whatever their new, oh gosh, what are they called? That those, not, not Citadel washes. I think they call them, I don't know what the heck they call them. But that, look at that blue. That is just a nifty, it just gives it a nice ethereal look. I'm going to throw a little bit of this warm gray. This is the neutral gray that we've used for years. And by years, I mean potentially six years, seven years, something like that. Now you see I got the shallow angle here on the movement tray. And see how the brush is held right to the side. And what it's doing is it's, just, it's catching some of those raised areas. It's amazing what you can do just with the angle of an airbrush. You hold it at a certain angle and you say, wow, look at what I can do. I'm spraying a little bit of that gray over the top. It's more to hit the the bases underneath them than anything else. It's not so much about getting gray on the miniatures themselves. And especially on those ones in the back there, that's where I use those Green Stuff World basing pieces. You can see the lion heads and such. That was really neat. Because I think if some of you have seen my Facebook post, you know, and I've already used some of those to make Lannister objective markers. These banners are part of the unit. So here's our tan, sandy colored primer again. So this will go over the top, and now you'll start to see if I just dust this over the top, that slate blue, it's going to drift through just a bit. It's not going to be super noticeable, but when you hold them next to one of those reddish brown ones, you'll really see the difference. I see it, it's, it's capturing a little bit of that but it, I'm trying not to completely annihilate 
all of that slate blue that's underneath. I think it's one of the reasons why I don't pick them up and do that because I, I used to do them maybe on a more individual basis and I found that because it was easier to hold just one figure and point the airbrush at it, the temptation was to put too much on there. So this sort of artificially pushes me away from doing too much of the lighter colored primer and wiping out everything that's underneath. Now again, ultimately, I've been told over and over again that the King's Guard is supposed to have sort of almost like porcelain armor, like white porcelain, white cloaks, white shields. Yeah, it's white, but you need variety. And, and right away, even now, yes, they're lighter. They already got some variety on them. Let's say I was to hit them. Okay, you take my final layer of white, spray it over the top like I'm going to do. And then I just... If you want to get them done real fast, heck, you could just take some tan washes or something like that and put them over the top or a grayish blue wash or whatever. They would be ready for your tabletop tournament, whatever, if that's all you want to do with them. When it comes to my painting, it's going to be taken a lot further. That's why I do the painting videos. This won't be an official unit painting video, but like I said, these guys are actually going to be done in oils just because... I want to try it. So the white primer, this is an even more gentle dusting over the top. Even though these guys are going to be white in the end, and I'm doing the air quotes you can't see, I don't want to get too crazy with that. So, so uh, look at that. I'm just dusting it right over the top. I got to be careful. Got to keep the slate blue. I even want to keep a little bit of that tan slash yellowish color as well. The other thing, I, I know people, when I'm at shows and study, they talk about how, but the dual action triggers. They say, ah, I don't think my hand can do that. See how far away? That's several inches away. It's like eight, nine inches, maybe ten inches away. You can see, look at how the broad spray that I'm getting. If I was to have that brush right up close on those guys, well, <laughs> I'd have a real narrow spray. I'd also probably be knocking those banners over. So holding it back, I don't necessarily have to be moving that trigger backwards to get an additional spray out of it. So it's it's one way if you're not quite able to do that dual action stuff, just hold the airbrush closer or farther away. Hold it farther away, you're going to get more, a broader spray. Again here, I know actually it's generally advocated that every time you do a color, so he, say between the slate blue and the gray, between the gray and the tan, the tan and the white, the rules say you should be running the airbrush cleaner through it. Well, I would be going through 10 gallons of that stuff for one thing. And I'm, and I'm not joking because this priming video is only going to be maybe an hour and something long. Overall, this was a three-hour priming session. There was stuff that you didn't even... I didn't even film because it, it would just would have been redundant. I think I did three more units like the conscripts. You didn't need to see me do three of the same thing because it would have been it was all the same colors. Now here, this is a little other thing. I just wanted to show you this. Let's say you got some either dark brown or in this case black. Take the black. No, that's not for Night's Watch. You take that black color and you can spray it around the bottom parts of your miniatures especially around the bases you get that much more shading here because I've got these stone bases if they get a little bit darker so look at how much darker that is and what we'll do is we'll spray it along that edge I do have to watch out for overspray remember in the first segment we talked about using the overspray to help kinda get some primer on the rest of our figures well, black overspray on my miniatures now, not helpful. Some of it's going to get on the cloaks. Some of it's going to get on the lower areas of the figures. Well, that's not a problem. It's just, they're going to be darker anyways. They're in shadow. It serves as a bit of a reminder. I used to do this on every single miniature. Every unit I did, I did this. Well, it was partially to conserve my black primer and to conserve time. Because I said, you know what, I'm going to be doing my glazes anyway. It doesn't really save me that much time. 
like I said, if you're looking to do, I mean, heck, if you're just going to dip these figures in the Army Painter dipping sauce, as I like to call it, well, then no big deal. But this, I really just want to do this as a little bit of a demo for you to, to show you that, okay, yeah, the, the bottoms of those bases now, they're practically white. They don't have to be. You can, you can go in reverse. You don't have to just prime lighter, lighter, lighter. You can do the opposite. It's like the Shade Spire guys here. That's where I could have started out basically with a white primer. Yeah, especially at the heart of the ethereal glow that I was going to do for them. Start out with the white primer and then work darker over the top. In this case, like I said, when you check out the YouTube channel or the Patreon page for the other tutorials that I've got, you'll see how I deal with this setup that I've got for this unit right here. Or, well, technically, two units. If you count the Shade Spire guys as, as a separate thing. So what I'm going to do is, yeah, see here, it's going to get some of that, the rest of the base, there's kind of a wrought iron type thing going on, and it just catches a little bit of that. Now with what's left of the black, well, now I can hit the sides of the movement tray. Because, well, those are going to be dark. Same shallow angle. Same shallow angle that I was using on all the other colors, but now it's going to catch those same edges but it's going to give them a little bit of a, a little extra of a dark right there. Now, obviously, it's a little shiny. I'm not going to worry about the interiors of the circles because you just paint those by hand. It's just easier that way. So what we're going to do is we're going to really switch this out here, and we're actually going to try some busts. Because now we've got this unit done, we're going to try some Blackheart busts. We're going to try some a couple of Big Child Creatives busts. We're going to do... Again, some little different colors here. We got a couple of dinosaurs, and we'll be right back with that in just a second. Let's move on to our busts here. We got a couple from Blackheart models and a couple from Big Child Creatives. Both really interesting. You can see it's they both have very different properties to them. I think that's why I wanted to try these things, because they're just really different from each other. We're going to start out actually with some green here. Not because the dinosaurs are going to be green. It's just because this is what I want to contrast some other stuff with. Now the resin here, and you can see there's a lot of crevices on this. It's another thing where I'm not going to worry about getting every last nook and cranny completely covered in green. We're going to do other layers over the top. But I'm also going to be painting these. I think one is going to be painted in oils, one in acrylics. I like to go back and forth just because I don't want people to think, well, he only uses oils on this, or only uses oils on that, or only acrylics. It's, paint is paint. It works on everything. And so is primer. So yeah, the green here is just something for me to play with. I primed some of these Blackheart models, busts, and these were... Uh, the portrait ones, like the, the female ones and some of the historical busts, I started out with that slate blue that you saw. And then I put pink over the top of that. And then I put that sandy color. And guess what? The combination of those three things, it gave me this interest. It looked like flesh tone. If you check out my blog and see the Angelique bust that I did, that was painted almost entirely in Badger Airbrush primers, believe it or not. That's mostly what I had to work with. It looked like skin tone. It was amazing. Now, here's that slate color again. And when that gets thrown over the top of these, it's going to be kind of interesting. I'm also going to do it on the Big Child Creatives bus, too. And it's going to look really weird. I mean, when it starts out, you're going to say, what in the world is going on here? But it's something, again, I'm trying to think of playing off of this when my paint comes in. See, even now, just at this early stage, that looks kind of interesting, having that, that sort of a bluish tint over the top of the lighter green. 
I'm, I'm basically playing around with the primers, trying to see, you know, when I eventually paint this, do I want to have that top part of his head be darker? The typical dinosaur thing, where the underside is always a lighter color and the top is darker. But I'm already starting to get a transition. And all it is is primer. And these are big, heavy chunks of resin. So it's never a bad idea to cover up your big, heavy chunks of resin that you can only handle with your bare hands with lots of primer. Yeah, this is going to seem a little bit sort of obvious, but we're going to take the gray and we're going to hit the bases with it. I'm also going to hit some of the dinos with it as well. Now, these guys can be a little top heavy and, and it's, they can fall over easy. So if, if one of these or both falls over in the course of this segment, don't be surprised. But they're all giant one piece for the most part, except for the, the carapist dinosaur over there. You have to put on a few extra pieces on him. But they're pretty, they are rugged. They're, they're designed to be pretty sturdy resin pieces. And look at how that gray, this is another thing too, see how much warmer that gray seems by comparison because we got two cooler colors out there we have the green and we have the slate blue that's the whole idea here and there we go off the edge no big deal I might I'm tempted actually to do some kind of a jungle backdrop primordial thing behind these guys and that's the other thing. Now that I hit success filming this, I'm going to try and film some 2D painting tutorials with the airbrush. It's something I did. Again, I was talking about my blog. Sorry it's not listed on here. It's at the end in the closing credits and in the description on the, on the YouTube thing here. You'll see it. This metal smith here, all it is is just a dark gray. It, it's actually my favorite part of the metal smith paint set because the rest of it is essentially ghost tints and other primers but this is a unique gray primer it's a dark gray it's not black it's still got warmth to it so I would say as opposed to a Payne's gray this is more of an ivory black again ivory black is not black it's just a very dark but warm gray see how we're, we're hitting the underside of it here it's almost like our bases that we just did on our Kingsguard and just throwing up some primer underneath the inside of that dinosaur's mouth there's no way you're getting primer in there with the airbrush without just wasting a lot of time again brush on primer oh wait we have brush on primer it's our it's in our hands so see we're just all I'm doing is throw out a little few dark indications even if this is all I do at this point this is it and I just stop right here that's pretty that's nice <clears throat> but I'm gonna keep going here a little bit I'm gonna throw the sandy stuff over the top because I want this to be neutral I don't want to be too influenced by those colors now at Gen Con and anywhere else I go that George and Ken are both together that is Badger and Blackheart models I'll be painting some of these dinosaurs in the booth at Gen Con but I'll be trying to use the airbrush more and the brush a little bit less. This, all we're concerned with is priming. But look at this seat. You can still see the green. You can still see the blue. You can even still see some of that darker gray in there. And it, it, it sets the tone for me real nice. It's something that I can take advantage of now with my gouaches, glazes, whether it's acrylics, whether it's oils, whether it's both doesn't matter now I've got something that says okay where my lights and darks should be it's a little bit of pre-shading that I can now play with now these are obviously bigger and heavier than the big child bus that you're gonna see in a second <clears throat> so they require a little more, more of a heavy spray the white once again minimal just as little bit as possible. I don't even know if you're going to see the airbrush in the frame here. Yeah, so you can you can't even see the airbrush in the frame. That's how hard or how far away it's being held, because I want just the most gentle dusting, and that's it. And wherever the highlight areas might be. 
that's not to say that eventually that carapace is going to get a whole bunch of shading on it and be much darker. But this again, it's almost like I'm shining a flashlight on the figure and looking to see where my lights and darks are going to go. Now, if you see me running through the airbrush cleaner here, well, it makes sense because I had to kind of put these off to the side and then I got to grab the, the big child busts. I do suggest wearing gloves as I, I'm always reminded when I don't have a glove on and I do this priming stuff. Your hand is going to be that color for a while because it's primer. The paint, well, you can probably wash that off a little easier. Primer, the only way that's really coming off quickly is if you basically wash your hands in rubbing alcohol. And to some of you may not like that. So you put a glove on, you don't have to worry. So now we've got our, our two dinos. They're pretty much they're good to go. Once again, look at you can't even see the airbrush in the frame. <laughs> this is how far away it's being held. So what we'll do is we'll just clean out the airbrush again. The other thing you can do, and now the soup tar doesn't have a cap for it, but let's say you're using the 105, and that's an all-purpose one that I use all the time. I use it all the time leave some of that brush cleaner in there, put the cap on the nozzle, put the cap on the uh, on the cup, and believe it or not, that stuff, that liquid will stay wet for a long time and it keeps your brush uh, workable way easier. I, I wish the Sotora had a cap over it. So we're starting out, see we've got this, well, it's fairly obvious what's happening here. We've got this pilot figure. We're going with a brown sort of a leather base right here. <clears throat> I could have gone with the ebony but because I also want to hit some of the skin with this, I'm starting out a little lighter. There is one more piece to this puzzle here <clears throat> but it just, I didn't want that many pieces and parts here. I'm just trying to keep the video to a certain length. But this one was a little bit harder to get the primer in places because as you can see there's a lot of Talking about a lot of places to underspray in there. Once again, I'm just going to take a regular brush, and if I'm missing primer in some spot, hey, what the heck, I'll just grab it and spray it. Well, not spray it, just put it on there with a brush. Now you'll probably be real, I just I can't wait for, well, where am I? I won't be able to see the expression on your face when I hit the, the samurai lady there with the slate blue primer but it should be interesting and I do believe this is the first opportunity I get to, to show you what the pink primer can do it's not called pink it's actually probably called a light flesh tone I think that's its actual name so here's our slate blue and this is gonna be a lot of fun because when you this one here I'm still undecided do I do I've seen the armor painted in gold. I said, well, okay, well, why the heck would you paint it or prime it slate blue if you're going to do gold over the top? One of the key colors in gold, believe it or not, is green. And you, you're painting yellows over the top. You leave some of that blue show through. Well, guess what? You got your green. And that's also kind of a mid-tone green, which is that that tends to be a shadow color for gold. Mid-tone and shadow color is green also purple. Now remember too, I, I told you about those black heart busts where we did the, oh my god, look at that, that that smoke. You can see that that's with the thing going at full blast. So you can see how much of that dust can float around. So we're going to go with the sandy stuff over the top of this. And remember I was talking about this the skin tone where I had the blue first and then went over the top of it. This is again another chance for me to tint my, my skin tones a different color. Now this is something different. We did not do the step with the green. So this is, we're just going straight in with that sandy tan primer color. Because, well, it's leather. Maybe she's got blonde hair. And you can see the, the direction we're going to go here. Now also, too, this is, we're talking about that Zenithal primer earlier. This is where we're going to go. See here, look at the angle I've got it. And I'm pretty much going straight down. That is your classic 
zenithal lighting. And it's worth it here, and look at what that does. It's it's almost like it's it's being painted in front of your eyes, and it's nothing but primer. Which, again, is important, because this is going to be handled a lot. It's going to be handled a lot. Now, I, I guess I can pin it to something if I want to do that. I'm going to be painting this in oils, so it is going to be pinned to something. And I'm also going to paint my own backdrop for that. I, it comes with a sort of a chrysanthemum type backdrop, a little sculpted piece, but oh, I can't resist to, the opportunity to paint my own backdrop. So we're dusting over the top here. You, know, you hit it with a little bit of the white. It gives it one extra level of lighter shading. That's all it takes. I Man, don't want to go too nuts with it. You go too crazy, you kill all the blues, the, the browns, all that that interaction of the colors that they mixed without mixing. Okay, again, you can't even see the airbrush in the frame. That's how far away it is. And this, this spray booth is something along the lines of when it's set up, it's almost 20 inches wide. So if you can't see that, and I, I know the camera distorts things a little bit, so here was one last zenith all over the top of this just a touch and it brings out all those fun little details in the armor the shoulder pads the stuff on the back the hair the face all kinds of neat stuff so now that we've taken care of this we're gonna go even bigger and by big I mean really big we've got a friggin huge monster we're gonna throw on the board here for you and we'll show you how to deal with that but there we go we got a couple of busts they're all ready for some paint so we'll catch you in the next segment real quick. All right, as we grab our ebony primer once again to start this off, told you there was some big stuff waiting. That's a big honking chunk of resin right there. It could be from Brigade models. Could be. I'm not sure. That's something I'll I'll look up if I can find it. I'll just put it in the description later. But we're just gonna again start off with the ebony. It's not important to cover the whole thing because something this big and this much resin, I need as much or as many layers of primer as I can possibly get on this beast. The orc off to the side. It's not quite as important, and I may do his skin tones actually in sort of like orange and purples I'm gonna try and match the big child colors because I'm gonna take the basically their color scheme and try and show you how to do it in oils if I, I got another one I may able to do a different color scheme or paint in acrylics or something like that so you, you can see I'm not it's not a big deal not looking to cover absolutely every bit of these guys now you, you thought it was weird when the slate blue showed up wait till you see what shows up in this particular segment as the next color you're just gonna go what in the world is he thinking but it's gonna be interesting so we're just doing a few more sprays of ebony I'm really more interested actually in, in covering up that white material if you're wondering what that is it's a, some of it is plastic putty from Vallejo and some of it is actually a white stucco from Vallejo and that's how I basically kind of sort of re-sculpt the hair because there was a big old mold line not the hair on the back of my hand on the guy although we're probably about the same amount of hairy actually he's not as hairy as me anyways I'm, I'm just trying to get that an equalization between the darker gray and the white it's a real easy way of re-sculpting fur even on smaller stuff too and here we go this is the pink or light flesh as it's called. Remember I, I went back to that segment where I told you about the busts where I, I hit some pink on there and once it was covered over with some other colors be darned if it didn't look like flesh tone already and all it was was nothing but primer. So we're doing the same thing here and we're just again cleaning out the brush a little bit in between some of the primer colors they can be a little thicker than others. The ebony tends to be a thicker color. Actually, the pink, the slate blue, is always a really nice consistency. 
So here we are. So we're just shooting a little bit of the cleaner through there. Now I'm I'm actually shoot, I'm being nice here, and I'm actually shooting it at the filter like you're supposed to. In person, I get maybe a little naughty, and I actually spray it at people. <laughs> it's cleaner after all. Hey, it smells nice. And look at this. We're gonna go right over the top with this pink. And you say, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, pink, pink troll here, whatever. I thought they're supposed to be greenish or gray. Yeah, but when you have this as an undertone, it really makes the painting process a little easier, especially when you're looking to do some different things. He looks really crazy right now, and so is Mr. Orc here. Yeah, this is, oh, this is also a, it's a 75 millimeter sculpt, I should say that. Once again, from Big Child Creatives. I'm going to have a, a special pledge level for those on, on Patreon soon. They'll be the standard kind of pledge level. You just watch the video, and there'll actually be a pledge level where you can get, you can actually get the miniature that I paint. And here we're going to get on the underside of this thing with the pink. Nothing fancy. At this point, remember it's all primer. I'm not trying to prime a pink flesh tone here. I'm just getting primer there. It happens to be that pink color. And I'm going to throw some green over the top of this. And as soon as the green hits it, once again, because of how far away I hold that airbrush, so far away, it, it blends. So all I'm doing is, again, is throwing some cleaner through here again. Because I have to just, I have to constantly stop. When you keep going and don't stop, you'd be amazed at how long your airbrush can go. I, I, I understand why people advocate cleaning in between colors, but we're talking about some mixing here. Here's our camo green, olive green, whatever you want to call it. When that dusts over the top of this, it's also good for the base too, because even though I'm going to go with kind of a snowy base on this thing, I think it's going to be really, really interesting. When you see that green going over the top, it starts to mix, especially the f the farther away I hold the airbrush itself. Now, I do this on the Orc too, not to the same degree, because I don't necessarily want to do green skin tone on the Orc. But see here, it's not green. If that had just been, if I had that been my first color there, it would have looked green. But look at how the green almost turns it like a grayish type color. You can still see a little of that pink underneath. How many times have you tried to do those those glazes for undertones or whatever to get interesting purples on your skin tone or pinks? What if they were already there? What if just by priming things? In the, in the process of priming, you already got those pink undertones. This is stuff that I just sort of... I discovered actually by accident because I kept running out of certain colors and all of a sudden I was like okay I got three jars of slate no black no brown what am I gonna do so I, I had no choice but to play with some of the other primers now with the orc it's gonna be a little bit less of a dusting right here because I, I didn't want him to be I want to keep as much of that lavender pink whatever undertone as I can for him the rest of this, well, now you've seen it a few times. You can probably guess. After this, we're going to go with our sandy colored primer, start to throw a few lights on there. I try to get some more green into the base on his face and on the here parts of it. You can mask this stuff off to, oh gosh, what's this stuff called? Pa parafill. Yeah, it's called parafilm. That's really nice masking stuff because it doesn't actually stick to the miniature. It works more like saran wrap. So you don't, it doesn't, there's no residue to leave. It has no adhesive residue. And here we're getting in with our, like I promised, our sandy colored primer. And what we'll do is that same dusting over the top. And by now, you know, you can say, okay, how close does he have that airbrush can we see the airbrush in the picture if you see spray but no airbrush that's where I'm trying to do that gentle dusting now 
with the orc, it's a little bit different because he's going to get more of the Xenothal, classic Xenothal. I could have done it on this guy too, but I was trying to be a little more direct. As I said, the airbrush is a little closer here. I'm also trying to hit the base, trying to get some sheeting on those rocks. Most of the rocks are sculpted, actually all the rocks are sculpted in the base. A few of the logs are. I just added some just bits of tree branches to fill out and kind of extend that base a little bit. Because originally, I want to say that base only covers maybe two-thirds of the oval base, the sculpted parts anyway. And all the rest of that was built up with some of that Vallejo oxide paste. So again, we're we're making this lighter and lighter. He's also going to be painted in oils. As is our Big Child Creatives orc. It's part of the, the Black Sailors. Yeah, it's part of the Black Sailors line. They're actually going to do another line. They're going to be doing some dwarves. And eventually you'll see me working on those. And you can see here there's a little more of that classic sort of Zenithal over the top. But man, look at look at my glove. So this is barely a, an hour. Well, I think this is more than an hour into it because I was priming other units. I just didn't film it. So here we have one last dusting of white over the top. Think of how many layers of primer I got on this big guy here. I would say minimum seven. In some areas, I might have eight or nine layers of primer. Yes, I'm going to do the dull coat over the top but a resin piece you're going to handle with your hands just like our big child orc there not bad having eight nine layers of primer so we're just going to do some final thoughts here talk about what we've done and we'll be right back in just a second now that the dust is settled and that's quite literally you can take a look at what we've been able to prime here so you've got your units right here, and I think you can see that there's a little bit of a difference. One's got more of a bluish tint to it, the other one's got more of a reddish tint. And as we look back here at our big guys, we've got our busts. Let's see if we can just reach in here and grab one of these. Focus may bounce back and forth, but I think you can see that we've been able to get some nice sheeting and I know it looks really wacky there with the blue and everything and the pink and all kinds of weird stuff going on but in the end I think we got pretty good result even on our big monster in the back I also primed some other things too so we've got our shaggy dog here that's something I'm going to be doing in another tutorial in fact all of these things that you see here, the, the King's Guard, the Conscripts, the Big Child, the Black Heart Models bus, all of these things, these are going to be painted in videos for the YouTube channel, for the Patreon page. So, again, it's a mix. A lot of it goes to the Patreon page because they really help fund everything. I also want to thank the good folks at Badger. The airbrushes, yeah, the compressors, yeah, but this is really... A key thing right here it really doesn't happen without the Steiner res it covers everything metal plastic resin you name it it covers it and it does an amazing job whether it's a bust like this or a big dinosaur bust like this or a big honking gigantic massive piece of resin like that guy over there it's going to do really well covering all that stuff. So we even got some GW stuff here, some of these Shadespire figures here. So we'll be painting some of these, again, YouTube Live sessions. So you're going to want to subscribe. And you also want to hit the little bell icon there that gives you the notifications when I'm live or when new videos are posted, like this one. I hope this info is useful again. This is just how I approach priming. This is not an overall statement on how to airbrush or anything like that. I know I've just been asked so many times, well, how do you do the airbrushing and primer stuff? And people have seen it, where it's all this sort of pre-shaded look. 
can see little hints of red, little hints of blue in there. This is what I mean when I talk about the pre-shading. So thanks again for checking out this video. Be sure to see all the other content that's here on the YouTube channel and think about subscribing to the Patreon page if you haven't already done that. So thanks a lot and I will catch you on the next video.